Today is April 8th. The Bucks take the weekend series from the Orioles. Three straight wins to start the season. Sitting at 8-2, and two, it's 10 games in. What are we thinking? You're listening to the Bridge to Bucktober podcast. Yins guys, thank you for listening to the Bridge to Bucktober podcast where we talk all about them Pittsburgh Pirates and that. My name is Josh and I'm flying solo tonight. Before you turn it off, we do have a lot to talk about. Pirates are 8-2. 8-2 and two. Eight and two to start off the season. 10 games in, I've got a stool behind me that won't let me move my chair. We'll move that out of the way. Now I can be a little more comfortable here. So Jake came up for the home opener. Um, We had a great time. Went to the home opener Friday night in the terrible weather and all that fun stuff. And then, you know, he's just going to be visiting for a while now that he's into town. So he's he's, uh, not able to be on tonight. I think they're, I don't know, camping somewhere or something like that. So you got me. But, man, we've got so much to talk about. Got our first game at PNC Park. We've got the Pirates on a roll. We've got four straight quality starts finally. That's a thing. Uh, Three series wins to start off the season. We are 10 games in. So we've got a lot of takes. We've got a lot of, uh, you know, I guess just takes. We got a lot of people giving up on players, being super high on different players, saying whatever. But this is, you know, an eight and two start. Now we talk about like, oh, well, April last year, the Pirates started off hot too. And you're right. They did start off hot last year, but not really eight and two, I don't believe. Boy, I should have looked that up before we got started. But they didn't get that kind of a start. They... I think they dropped their first series in in Cincinnati and then, you know, kind of started taking off from that point. But either way, um, it's been great. And we had a fun time this weekend, despite all the rain, the snow, the ice, the cold, the wind, everything else that happened. It was a pretty good time. So let's get into it all. Before we do that, let's do a couple quick hits. Jackson Wolf. Uh, news has come in uh, from being DFA'd. He's been traded to the San Diego Padres for Kervin Pichardo. I think that's how you say that. Uh, Pirates acquired Joey Bart. More on this later for the Giants from the Giants for Austin Strickland, and delay was going on the ten day IL for that. Colin Selby was designated for assignment to make room for Bart. He was he ended up being traded to the Royals for left handed pitcher Connor Oliver. That's our quick hits. Uh, we did not do anything uh, before the home opener. Uh, I took some mics and we were we were going to try to do something and there was a parking thing and uh, whatever. I'm not going to bore you with those details, but basically what happened was we didn't record anything. And so there was a Washington series. I'll talk about it a little bit. We won the series. Um, I do want to touch on... A couple things since we didn't get to do that show. That do that show. Mitch Keller gets a loss in the middle middle game of the series. It was the first loss of the season for the Pirates. Five and one third inning, eight hits, four earned runs, two walks, five Ks. He now has a six fifty five ERA. Uh, I think already everybody knows the deal, right? What's with the cutter? I think that's the talk about everybody. What are we doing with the cutter? We're relying heavily on that cutter right now, not getting good results so far. I don't know when they say give up on it. I don't know when they say it needs to be sharper. Um, But either way, am I worried? I think is the question everybody's asking. Are are we worried about Mitch Keller and what we're seeing from him so far? I I don't think worry is the word. I think he's fine. Uh, Like I think he's healthy. I don't think there's going to be an issue like that. Uh, As we see going around the league right now, two very big-time starters. Uh, Bieber is out, and Spencer Strider maybe. 
this is going to continue to be a conversation. Listen, we just had a show earlier um, in the off season. Uh, I believe it was maybe coming into spring training around that time. We had a conversation. I think it was it was around the Moretta time, and we talked about um, Tommy John and and these elbow injuries and max effort on every single pitch and gripping the ball super tight and seeking velocity and spin rate over everything else. You can be an effective pitcher without all of this stuff. Um, man, I was I just can't help but think back at at the Tyler Glass now comments back uh, back then. And I know I'm going off topic here, but this is a big topic too. But you think about those Tyler Glass now comments that he made uh, basically when he was mad that he couldn't cheat anymore. And he was just like, we, you know, we're not allowed to use sticky stuff. So he changed everything he did. Grip the ball tighter, uh, put it deep in his hands instead of the egg thing. You know, we talked about that when we had our show. Um, uh, when we talked about the the injuries and everything, all of those things are contributing to to this whole uh, whatever you want to call it epidemic. I don't really know if it's you know if you use that kind of a word for pitching injuries in Major League Baseball, but you, you get it. Uh, and it's like, or maybe just learn how to pitch without that. Don't chase those things, and they're getting outs. And guys are going to keep doing it. I don't know if that has anything to do with Mitch Keller's decision to maybe go away from it. I don't really think that's the case. I feel like he's, I mean, he's still in the sweeper and that's, you know, part of this whole thing. So I don't really know. But either way, I'm not worried about him that way. Um, and I'm not sure what the word is I'm looking for either. But I, I'm, I'm not any of those things. It's two starts. It's two starts. I'm not there yet. Uh, he's going to start on Monday. So when this is being released, he's going to start tonight against the Tigers. We'll see how that goes and maybe give him one more because if he bounces back, I want to make sure that he stays bounced back. If you know what I mean? Like if he has a good start against the Tigers, what's he going to do against the Phillies? Because he's going to have to face the Phillies probably on, well, it's, if he pitches Monday, there'd be, or he will face the Phillies. It's a four-game set against the Phillies. So maybe, you know, Sunday, if I'm doing the math right, um, he'll be pitching against the Phillies and, and maybe in a big game against another really good team. So we'll have to see how he responds to that, maybe even a second time. Or if he doesn't pitch well against the Tigers, what's he going to look like against the Phillies? Uh, so I think, you know, next Monday, uh, we should have some comments on what we think about Mitch Keller. And uh, I think mostly... You know that's going to be a topic of conversation for the 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 Friday morning show that I plan on getting back on uh, Mondays and Fridays for the season. So um, Mitch Keller will be a topic of conversation there. I'm not ready to hit the panic button yet. Um, I think four starts is usually a pretty good number. If the third one's bad, maybe you're looking at five. If the fourth one's good, right? You want to get back to back starts to be good before you say like, okay, let's exhale or in a way, you know what I mean? So yeah, let's just see how it goes. Let's see how this week goes for Keller. He's going to throw twice before next Monday. So let's see, let's see what we got here. Martin Perez gets the win Thursday. First quality start of the season for the starting pitching staff. Bednar gets his first save. Listen, he's fine guys. We'll talk more about Bednar later, but a road series win. Uh, you always like those back to back was a sweep and then a road series win. Great way to start off the season for this team. Uh, but the Pirates continued with the Martin Perez quality start as we move into the Baltimore series. And now I'm going to take my time a little bit. Now I'm going to take my time a little bit because obviously we had a home opener, which is bigger than than maybe just hey here's a series. Uh, I was at Friday night's game or. Uh, Friday afternoon and Saturday afternoon games. Uh, so went to both, was back home before Sunday, so didn't go to that one. So for me, I saw a split. But the Pirates finished uh, another walk-off on Sunday to take the series from the Orioles. Very exciting, but there's a lot of things to talk about, a lot of things to break down as we talk about this. I'm going to start off with with just a little bit here. Um Another home opener. 
another home opener for our family. Our kids have never missed one, so it's always very exciting. Um, our two boys are, are starting to get, well, our, the older of the two is four, so he's starting to get some of those things. Like he, this time he reacted to coming out of the tunnels. We came in the night before, coming out of the tunnels at night, seeing the city. He, he kept saying how it was awesome and all this stuff. So, I mean, that's uh, that's all good. Uh, and if you've, <laughs> I have to say, I have to say, if you've been listening a long time and you know, you know, the last three years, the the food stuff that I've dealt with as a post COVID thing, we went to. I've I've been eating some some beef lately. It's been a good thing. Love and life. Now that I can do that, um, still some some ways to go. But on our way into town, we stopped at my favorite place uh, in Pittsburgh, and that's Uncle Sam's sandwich. And I love the you know you got the Philly cheese, you got all the things there, right? But I love the cheeseburger sub. Their bread is amazing. I love their cheeseburger sub and was able to eat a cheeseburger sub and fries have been hit and miss but their fries were so good and it has been geez over three years since i've been able to eat there so it was a very good feeling great way to start off the weekend it felt great um man i i if you don't know then you just don't know but if you do you you kind of you probably had a little bit of a smile there anyway uh really cool uh, time. Friday's weather was unreal. The pictures and the images from the TV when I went back and I saw them are just incredible. Uh, namely the the Rowdy Telez at bat. It did seem that every time the weather got bad, the Pirates were up. But like, come on, we're not going to blame that on anything. The Orioles are a good team. And I thought it was a really great series. I don't think any of them were really that bad. Uh, Jones gives up a couple homers. Even though he lost, did he have the best start of the weekend? You had all three quality starts from the starting pitching. Somehow Bailey Falter did it. Uh, it was funny <laughs> going into the Saturday game. We were kind of hesitant to buy tickets. We weren't sure. It was one of those things. I was like, we have to wait till after the game because if McCutcheon would have hit number 300 on Friday night, I don't think we would have went on Saturday. And then coincidentally, he doesn't play on Saturday. So like we purchased the tickets and we were so cold the night before that I was like, I have to get, I have to get club seats so we can go into the warmth. And the funny thing was, is it was the weather was fine on Saturday. We never went in (laughs) other than at the beginning. We never left our seats during the game. So we didn't have to go in and get warm. It was already warm enough. So, um, Kind of funny. And then it was like, oh, Kutch isn't playing. We're still going. And and if I if I took you through like the whole morning, it was kind of funny because we got up, we did our thing, we got out of our hotel, because uh, we stayed on the North Shore. And then we were like, let's go, let's go do a couple things. We went over to Steel City. But like before that, I don't know if you guys I don't know if you guys know. I have a monster energy drink every morning. It's my coffee. Okay. I've I've got cans over here. I mean, I, I've got a couple, right? But every morning, like I I get it off Amazon by the case. <laughs> I just walk into my fridge and that's what I have. It's, it's my coffee. And so we get up, we can't, I just don't know why you can't just like, I don't know, it's not easy to just stop somewhere and get it, right? Especially in, in the city or whatever. So we go over to Steel City. There's a Rite Aid right there. I was like, I'll go there. No, there's no Rite Aid there anymore. It's closed. There's nothing inside there. <laughs> so we go into Steel City. It's no big deal. I haven't really eaten. There's no place to eat. So we uh, we do a little bit. I got a you know shirt, hat, whatever. Let's go get something to eat. We're looking at a couple different places. Um, I get a recommendation. Gary, Gary Morgan says, go to Kelly O's. I went to Kelly O's. We pull into the parking spot, have to pay. Well, we didn't pay yet, right? You swipe, you swipe your ticket. You're like, we're going to pay. We're going to get in. We walk around the corner, huge line of hipsters out, huge line of people outside of Kelly O's. I was like, dude, we, we don't have time. So we get back in our car and I'm like, we're going to have to pay eight bucks because we parked in this place. And then, but it, it was like, oh, you made a mistake. It didn't make us pay. So we got out of there. So we ended up driving over to, we were on our way to the Clemente Museum. And so 
We stopped there, whatever. We went to the Clementi Museum. Great time. If you haven't gone, you should go. It's a really cool place. Um, it was interesting in like many different ways. The, the, the type of documents that they have there were kind of like, well, they, they just take anything. Uh, but it's also cool to see some of the like non Clemente things where they had like bats that were just different players that just visit. They'll donate bats and cleats and jerseys and uh, they were signing balls. And uh, but there's a lot of stuff in there. It's not just all that though. You know, I was some of the, like the pirates uniforms back when like Wagner played and you're just like, dude, they had to be dying in the, in those jerseys. But it was really cool. Uh, always, uh, I would recommend it to anyone who's never gone. It's really cool. Um, but the whole time, you know, it's just kind of one of those things where we're like, oh, I haven't eaten. I said, let's just get to the stadium. We'll we'll park. We'll eat. It'll it'll be fine. We'll go inside. Um, so we did that. We got a burger. Like I said, the meat's still hit and miss for me, so it was terrible. So it was like fifteen bucks, basically, that you just threw out the window. Anyway, it just kind of felt like there's just a ton of things just not going our way. And I remember looking at Katie and saying, and now we're not going to see a Kutch homer. <laughs> we got Bailey Falter. This is going to get ugly. This is going to be a bad day. And then we sit down. We got Orioles fans behind us. We got Orioles fans beside us. And I'm just like, all right, be positive. You never know. And then Bailey Falter goes like five no-hit innings, and the, the people beside us were really nice. Can't say the same about the ones behind us, but, um, and, you know, it was ended up being obviously a fun time. You get to see some extra innings. You see a walk-off. Uh, it was real exciting. But it was just funny because, like, you think, you think you've got it all set up. There's been twice now that everybody said, here's the trash lineup that we're throwing away and we're not trying to win. And we've won both of those games. I guess that speaks for, hey, this is good depth that the Pirates have right now. But it also just says like, hey, we're finally in a place where like we can put whoever in the lineup. And we've still got a good shot to win a baseball game. I still can't figure out how Bailey Falter did it. One strikeout. One hit, and really it was a miscommunication in the outfield. We can talk about that. Uh, but first, you know, let's just keep going with with just the whole thing here. Ran into some friends. Ran into some people Friday night, Saturday. Met some new friends. Um, yeah, Gary, I mentioned him. Uh, Michael from 412 Double Play. Ethan from Locked On. Jim from FanForm as well. Uh, Queen Banshee and Scribbler and Scrivener. Scribbler. That's funny. They'll laugh at that. Uh, ran into them. Uh, and then Saturday, uh, Scott and Adam from Bucko Banner got to meet those guys. Uh, and then Brad and Toby were sitting behind us. It was funny. Uh, and I'm going to call you out, Brad, because I know you're going to listen. We actually we gave him a card for the show, and he was like, oh, I listen to you guys. So it was fun. We got to do that. But uh, there was a moment in the game when uh, – who was, who was rounding third? I'm trying to remember – it was the base hit to center field that we held up the runner uh, at third and they ended up scoring. And I can't, I can't, now I can't remember who that was. That would have been, we held up Reynolds, I believe. Held up Reynolds at third instead of sending him home on the base hit. And uh, Brad, you were mad. <laughs> <laughs> you were, why aren't we sending him now? Cedric Mullins. I, and I kind of said like, Hey, he's got a great arm. Probably not a great idea. You go back and you watch the play. He definitely would have been out. Um, but in that moment, it, it was kind of an interesting call because we've had Rebello sending guys and getting thrown out. And then here we are in this moment where you felt like he was gun shy. And it's like, we're down, you know, we're down to nothing. You've got to get him in. Actually would have been down maybe 3 nothing at that time. Oh, no. Whatever it was. I only have the 3rd through the 11th now in the, in the timeline. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click around a little bit. Right, could you imagine? Yeah. Anyway, it was fun. Uh, we didn't get to meet, meet up with as many people Friday night. So if you were on that list of people we were trying to 
um, connect with or, or we messaged back and forth or whatever. Uh, it, it was bonkers. The weather was crazy. We had all the kids there. We had our parents there. So it was, it was kind of a blur. Um, but like I said, Jared Jones might have had the best start of the weekend and he lost his game. A couple homers he gave up and just couldn't get anything going offensively. You go into Saturday, Joey Bart, it, it had to be one of the funniest things. Uh, you know, you got Bailey Falter dealing. Bart gets up, and, and it did feel like half the Pirates fans at the stadium had no idea who this guy was. And by the end of it, we're doing Joey chants. It was hilarious. Bout, ha- Bout had two home runs. The double was, was close. Uh, just a great story. A lot of fun. <laughs> baseball is set up for so much of that. It always is. It's always set up for so much of those weird things to happen, whether it's Falter's start or whether it's Joey Bart's game that he had. It was just incredible. But uh, it was a lot of fun. We had Telez sliding into third. We'll get into that. I actually want to wait on that. Um, Let's go first into some of the sloppy play. We've got base running, whether we talked about this a little bit last week, whether it's it's, uh, players' base running errors or whether it's sending them, either way. The base running and the fielding errors, whether they're throwing or, or, or actually fielding, we saw that kind of develop a little bit on Sunday in the game where Baltimore had the, the double play they should have made. The pitcher throws. Really, I felt like it was a catchable ball for Mateo. Missed it. It goes into right field. I felt like that was, uh, and, and he ended up scoring on the, on the sack fly by Henry Davis, but that error really could have been still at least one out. But either way, it's a fielding mistake. Um, And that is, let's say that's by Mateo. You also had Mateo make the play of the weekend. That ground ball that Hayes hit up the middle that he laid out for was incredible. Got the out. And it was right after Henderson had made one of his own. Just an, an incredible defense. And we saw... I don't know. I I feel like two to four plays in the outfield each day, game, each game, because there was like no real night games, right? They were all just afternoon and a day game. So anyway, each game, Baltimore made multiple crazy plays in the outfield. Diving plays, uh, specifically Mullins. Hayes had a couple. Hayes also lost one in the sun, but dude, you lost it in the sun. I, I don't. I mean, I know it hit the heel of his glove. He should have had it. But once you lose something in the sun, man, you're seeing those spots as you're trying to field it. I'm giving him a pass on that one. Um, But incredible plays defensively, which shows that, like, they're they're there. Um, We had Taylor and Reynolds kind of meet in in right center and both just stopped and let a ball drop for a triple. Um, These are miscommunication plays. Uh, We had the one on Saturday where Sawinski was coming in. I'm leaving Reynolds out of it. He didn't have a shot to make that play. Sawinski's coming in. Alika's going out. They both stop and the ball drops, ends up being a double. And in both of these situations, what you have is a center fielder who needs to catch the ball. I don't know if uh, it like I was at both of those games. So I don't know what the, the broadcast showed, whether those guys were calling them the ball or not. If either one of them called it, it's a hundred percent on them. If, if Sawinski or Taylor called the ball, it's them. They have to catch the ball. I did hear, um, I think in, in our, in one of our group chats, uh, we were talking about the Taylor play a little bit, and I had mentioned because it was the Swinsky, and I said, "Hey, Taylor did the same thing last night. Like he's not, 
exempt from this. And there was a comment about Reynolds didn't hear him till the end. And that's fine. But why didn't Taylor catch the ball? I, it doesn't matter if Reynolds hears you. Why didn't you catch the ball? You pulled up because you got scared. You didn't want to run into him. And you missed the ball, which is the same thing that Swinsky did. He pulled up because he he got scared. He didn't want to run into somebody. I don't know who's calling, not calling. I, I do need to go back and watch those plays. It could be a little bit off on that. If Taylor was calling for the ball, then go catch the ball. Dude, you can't you can't stop. Um Sawinski, I think sometimes, and we've we've talked about this, and I think this is a pretty common um I'd say criticism of him in center field is that he's he's a little um I can't think of the word that, that people use, maybe timid. He doesn't take control. He doesn't call the ball and go get it. And as a center fielder, you have preference. If there's a pop-up to the catcher and the center fielder calls for it, the catcher needs to move out of the way. Center fielder gets priority over everybody else on the field. And if you can catch the ball, call it. Now, obviously, there's some like Kevin Kiermeyer plays where somebody could be camping in left field and Kiermeyer calls him off. Well, that's silly. He's done it, and the left fielder moved out of his way. Very unhappy about it. I think it was Rosarena not happy about it. But Kiermeyer jumps in and catches the ball because if the center fielder catches it, you get out of his way. If it's on the infield, the shortstop has priority. He can call off the first baseman if he wants to, and the first baseman should move if the, if the shortstop's calling it. So, if Sawinski's in center field on the only hit against Bailey Falter, he should have called that ball, and he should have taken it from Alika. If Alika doesn't hear Sawinski, he needs to go catch the ball. The ball was catchable by Alika Williams for sure. Um, so, him and him and Sawinski, either one, if nobody's calling that ball, they got scared, they stopped, the ball dropped. Those sort of things, they happen in April. It, whether it's the Taylor one in the outfield, I mean, you don't want to run into Reynolds, right? You're the new guy. You haven't played with Reynolds very much. There's a little bit of a miscommunication out there. That's fine. That makes sense. And the one on the infield, that's, I mean, I came in on a ball in batting practice when I was in 10th grade. And I called the ball. I was coming in. I was playing center. I come in. I slid down to catch the ball. So I wasn't sprinting because it was, you know, basically like a, it was like a live batting practice is what we were doing. And as I slid, as I lowered my eye level, I saw the freshman second baseman coming back. I turned. We collided. He broke his leg over my hip. That moment on, I was nervous going after those balls. And if I was going to call one, everyone within a mile heard me call it because I was nervous about it. I don't know if anybody has that kind of a history, but the point is, is it's a nervous play. You don't want to collide with people. I mean, we remember when Eric Gonzalez collided with Starling Marte and ruined uh, Starling Marte for a long time, shelved him for a long time. So, like, there's, you know, this is not a, a thing that, you know, in April, you get nervous about stuff like that. I'm not giving anybody necessarily a pass. Well, I guess I am. I am giving them a little bit of a pass. I mean, it needs to happen. You need to clean it up. You need to learn from what happened uh, on Friday and Saturday. But at the same time, this is kind of where I'm going with this. This is April baseball. We saw it with, with the Orioles on Sunday. We saw it with the Pirates in those two plays. We've seen Key make some errors, and you know that he's going to be in the gold glove conversation. Um these things are going to happen early in the season. Base running errors, uh, we talked about this before where the Pirates have made some base running mistakes. And I, I mentioned I watched every game on opening day and I saw several of them. And I'm still seeing them um, occasionally. And I don't, I'm not watching as many games as I do on opening day, but um, you know, it's still a thing that happens. We won a game because of an overthrow. A ball that, that Gunnar Henderson makes an unbelievable play to even get one out. I think they would have gotten one out, even if he didn't make the play that he made. I think they get one out on that play. The game's going to be tied, one out. 
but it, it makes it makes the inning would be two outs, right? You would have gotten one on the play, and you would have had a shot to get the next guy and keep Joe from scoring altogether. But instead, he he rushed a throw that he I mean he made close. When you watch the play, had he had he gotten the throw off as hard as he did and been able to keep it accurate, there's a chance he gets Oliveira's at first. There's a chance. I, there's some angles that look that look like Olivares was going to beat the throw either way, um, but other angles look like eh, maybe they do. And if he ends the game with that double play, it would have been incredible. It would have been an unbelievable play. Um, you know, just trying to watch some of the some of the buzz about it. Um, I uh, had a little back and forth with. Uh, Ryan Ripken, and he mentioned he probably should have put that in his pocket and not thrown it. That was his thing. One run scoring, he was already safe. You you forced a, a throw and ended up getting away from you, and you lose the game. So I mean, that's just a take from their side, right? A guy who's been around the game an awful lot. So, um, you know, that's kind of the vibe that I got with it too. I, I kind of felt, boy, once he's fallen down, and I, I actually think if he, he's got his right hand on the base, with the ball in his glove, if he pops up and keeps his body square, I think he can get that ball to first. I don't know if he has quite the... I don't know if he has enough to get the out, but he has enough to make it an accurate throw and keep the inning there. But when he reaches over with the glove to tag the base, which he didn't have to do, right? If you catch the ball with your foot on the base, he's out. If you're touching it with your right hand and catch the ball, he's out. And, and so he tags the base, and now he's completely twisted around, and he has to throw around Rowdy, um, but also cross-body. And that's probably what ultimately the off-balance cross-body back foot, like his drive foot is actually, if you look at the picture, it's kind of on its side a little bit, which is probably slipping. Just not a great position to throw an accurate throw. Not that you can't, but it would have been – like I said, an incredible play had he had he gotten away with that. And th- that wouldn't have been surprising. I mean, he'd already done that earlier in the game, made an incredible play. So, um, yeah, I was all around. I mean, you're, you're going to see mistakes like that in April. That's, I think it's just normal, and I think it's just game speed, right? You say, well, you should have got all that stuff out in spring training. Well, you kind of do. You get your, like your regular fielding ground balls, maybe footwork, maybe uh, um, fundamentals and things like that out of the way. But when April comes along and the regular season comes along, the game speed has maybe um, some of the mental side of it is, is still has to catch up. And that's the biggest thing with base running mistakes. You know, you've got... Uh, when when Cruz tags up on the ball to left field and tries to get to third, you don't have to do that. He's trying to be aggressive. I think there's a little bit with Cruz where he's going to have to learn that maybe he's not as fast as he used to be. He bulked up a little bit. He had the leg injury. He's probably not as fast as he used to be. I could be wrong on this. This is this is me going out in the left field and saying this stuff, but I think there's a chance he's got to learn that, hey, what you could have – I mean, he was close, but what you could have done – Maybe two years ago might not be might not be there right now, or maybe he just misread it because, like I said, game speed. He hasn't seen anybody throw maybe like that in spring training. Uh, I don't really know, but it happens every April, and we forget every April that it happens, and then we're frustrated every April that it's happening. And you know, the good teams will clean that up. The good defensive teams will clean that up. Not necessarily the teams who win the most. I mean, defense doesn't have anything to do with the other team, right? You either make your plays or you don't. So people who are capable of making the plays or not running into base running mistakes, they're going to clean it up. And they'll do that as the year goes. It's just not a big deal. So I'm not stressing about sloppy play. What I will say is that the Pirates are 8-2 and and haven't played a complete baseball game yet. They've 
you know, played against teams who probably also haven't played complete baseball games yet. And that's the thing. So if everybody's playing on the same kind of plane here, then you can see how it, it just, it's, it's equal, right? Because they're making these mistakes and you're making these mistakes. And, you know, I mean, Alika Williams had a routine double play hit to him and a run ends up scoring and, you know, and then they had the double play to the pitcher and the run ends up scoring. And I mean, it's, it's give and take on all those things. So you just don't know. I mean, it's April baseball. It's a little bit sloppy. And I think that if you make too much of it, you're just kind of, you're doing just that. You're making too much of it. I wouldn't worry much about that personally, but it was the airs, um, that, that kind of got the pirates, the win and you'll take it. You're eight and two. A win's a win. It's fine. I don't really know what else to say. Um, now let's get into Rowdy Telez being in the way of Henderson's throw. Does that play? I think it does. I think there's something to it. Um, if you watch the rest of baseball early in the season, you saw early in the season, earlier in the week, that's what I meant to say, you saw the Reese Hoskins, Jeff McNeil thing with Brewers and Mets. And he slides in a second base. Jeff McNeil doesn't get the out. He takes offense to it. He he starts yelling immediately to Reese Hoskins. I, I kind of felt like Hoskins was um, was taken by surprise a little bit. He gets up. He starts running into the dugout, not really thinking much of it. And then McNeil kept going. And you had a little bit of an argument where all of a sudden Hoskins was defending himself and then and then took it too far once everything happened. He was still yelling about it. Uh, even after they even after they said they said it was clean. He's still walking towards Hoskins saying, Do you think that's okay? And Hoskins is like, Yeah. And then he keeps on going. And then Hoskins ends up doing the thing, you know what I mean, where he, you know kind of took offense, made him look like he was crying, all of that stuff. Uh, there was some name calling, whatever. And we had a little bit of this th same thing. I, I, I watched uh, a couple days later, I watched uh, a video that, that John Boy put up. If you're not familiar with that, you can just look it up. You can look up. Um, I forget what he, what, what he had said. Basically they, they don't try to break up double plays. And it was funny because he was he was going through and he was talking about how he was kind of surprised that McNeil had a problem with this. And he broke it down and watched, and McNeil doesn't he doesn't slide into second on double plays. He doesn't even do what we've seen the Pirates doing the last year and what Telez did on this play, where they just keep running. Um McNeil just peels off and gets out of the way, just giving them the double play. And, you know, John Boy makes the point that he's like, I don't think that they know that you can slide. Like, he thinks that the team, the whole team, has the rule wrong. And I don't think so. I think that maybe he's... Um, there are more teams that we see doing what the Pirates are doing and maybe what the Mets are doing because he noticed that Lindor and McNeil both, which are the two middle infielders, they don't try to break up a double play. Lindor does run through second base a little bit more often. And so this one I do see, uh, I, his understanding was something about if they, if he's safe, he has to tag you or something like that. And then it throws, I don't really know. Um, but I don't know how that's possibly the thought that doesn't seem to be the thought from the pirate side of things. Telez is just running to be, if he goes down, he gives you a lane to throw the ball. It's dangerous, I would think, but he gives you a lane. Um, if he stays up, he's just running straight at you. That's what I think is dangerous. If he hits you right in the sternum, you know what I mean? Like, what is the rule there? It seems like he has a right to run to second base. I know in <laughs> like slow pitch softball and maybe some high school baseball stuff. I think that you have to avoid 
that. So if if you get hit, you're actually the guy at first is out. Um, I know at least uh, in old man <laughs> softball, that's what it is. Um, but in baseball, that's not the case, right? You have you're just running to the base, and he has to move around you. Jeff McNeil was just planted, throwing. So to take it to what happened with Henderson and Telez and what we saw all year last year, I kind of don't like it. I would rather you go in aggressive and try to try to take the 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 shortstop or the second baseman out within the rules. All they're saying within the rules, and I feel like what you've done is you've just taken the dirty play out of the game. Because you can slide in, you can break up a double play. We've seen guys sliding way off the bag. Not even, you can't even reach the bag. Way off the bag to break up a double play. And those are the ones that you deem dirty. Or cleats up, right? That's obviously a, a dirty play. Everything else is baseball. You you can slide into second and 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 you're supposed to put your hands up and try to distract and make him throw it away. If Telez is not in a position to slide yet, which he wasn't, then run straight through. Do exactly what he did. I thought it was fine. Um, but what Hoskins did at second, he could reach the bag the whole time. He ended up on the bag. And now I want to back it up to the day before. And Telez going into third. I don't think that... Um, let me get the name right here because I just – Westberg. I had it right. I had it right. I don't think Westberg is turning a double play on that play, but Telez slides and and breaks up the double play anyway. It's a To me, it's a heads-up, hard-nosed baseball play. He could reach the bag. His hands, both hands, were on the bag. He didn't slide past the bag. He stayed on the bag. Everything about it was within the rules. And, of course, there's conversation. The Orioles fan behind me who was, if I could try to think of how to explain what he was like. I'm not going to, actually. Um, But basically, he was, uh, it's like he forgot that the Orioles stunk just a few years ago. It's like he forgot that. Like, why are you coming? Anyway, there was a lot of things that were said. And we'll just leave most of it at the ballpark. But in this particular case, he was going at Telez and how dirty this was and how illegal this was. And the the, the two beside us were very nice Orioles fans. Um, Had a lot of great conversation with them. He said, well, with the new rules. And I said, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, he's within the rules so long as he can reach the base and stays on the base. If he slides clear past the base or he goes way out of his way and cannot reach the base, then it's that's what's... Basically, what they did with this rule is said, you can still break up the double play, but you can't do it if he's way off. Which is what now at third base, it's a little bit different. It's got to feel different, right? It's a little bit different at third base. At second base, the shortstop or the second baseman should be moving one way or the other, which is why I brought that Jeff McNeil thing up. He wasn't. Leg planted on the base. He was going to throw it the first from the base. And if the guy's coming in, like you've got to, that's why we have highlights of guys jumping over guys because you can do that. Anyway, third base is a little bit different, right? I don't think he's actually going to turn that, but he he was on one side of the base. He could have tried to throw across the infield, uh, but it's a little bit different of a of a setup. But either way, he could reach the base. He stayed on the base. He slid into the ba- like everything there is clean. He took out the the guy trying to turn a double play, which is a heads up baseball move. He didn't injure anybody. He didn't go cleats up. He just slid into the player which is what you're supposed to do. Uh, Maybe I'm old school. Maybe I'm old school, but it's within the rule. And of course, they challenged it. They called him out. They called everybody else safe. Then they went to review and they confirmed that everything was clean. It's not dirty and it's not against the rules. 
because what was dirty they made against the rules. I think I've made the point. Heads up base running by Rowdy Telez. Team player moments, hustle player moments. I, I have no problem with either one of them. They are both within the rules, and yet we're seeing, you know, the whole, oh, this is what they do kind of a thing. And, you know, you just want to address that. I thought they were good plays. All right. You get a series win. I don't know if I covered everything I wanted to. But I know that, you know, hey, base running, errors, all those things. Uh, Telez making good base running moves. Martin Perez, Jared Jones, <laughs> Bailey Falter again. Surprising. I have to go back and maybe watch that start because I'm, you know, sitting in the stands and I'm thinking, how? But anyway, Marco Gonzalez, I mean, I just thought that all of them, you're starting to see pitchers kind of get into the groove a little bit. Quality starts, getting six innings in. It's a good sign. It's a good sign for this team. This team has kind of been waiting. I mean, we knew that starting pitching was a problem. We're starting to see that it's maybe not as bad as we thought. We're hoping so. I mean, Jared Jones was a big one. I think a lot of us said, well, it would be a lot better if Jones is there. He has not disappointed. He has not disappointed. Uh, this guy's going to be a stud. Tomorrow night, Monday night, I should say, Monday night, we've got Keller going. If he can start getting going and he can start pitching the way that we know he can and then eventually you have Skeens coming up, those three guys are going to be fun. Those three guys are going to be fun. And right now, if it's Gonzalez, Perez, some kind of combination of whatever else is there, I mean, it's not, not that bad. <laughs> you, you kind of are looking at this saying, hey, this starting rotation could be decent. I mean, there's going to be starts, right? You don't know how long you're going to see Marco Gonzalez do this. You don't know how long maybe Martin Perez, although I still believe that Martin Perez can be a good pitcher, and I think this is a good fit for him. Uh, but obviously Marco with you know, maybe some injury concern. But you've got guys that you feel like could step in. Quinn Priester is, uh, you know, had a little bit of a different start, which is good. I think it's good. You want to see him do things that he can't do at, at the major league level. Because if he goes down there and dominates, then he's not getting better. You need him to, to, to struggle a little bit, to have something to, to show like tangible he's getting better stuff. So keep an eye on this stuff. It's This might not be that bad. It's early, guys. It's early. This is a 10-game thing, and that's the other piece of this whole thing. It's 10 games, guys. Let's, get, uh, let's back off a little bit on our McCutcheon's washed. Let's back off on our... Uh, Jared Jones, Rookie of the Year. Not saying he can't. He certainly can. Let's let it play a little bit. Let's not get too... Let's not... What do you say? Get the cart in front of the horse, whatever. Let's watch this stuff happen a little bit. Ten games. Uh, I've seen a lot of... Um, I just had somebody today. I am done with Jack Sawinski. Or, or Henry Davis is getting booed. Like, you're booing Henry Davis after ten games? Have a little patience here. That's kind of a really, really silly thing to do. At any moment, 10 games could be a bad stretch for any player, and it's not a big deal in the course of a season. But when it happens in the first 10 games, we freak out. You just don't have to. You just don't. Whoop, sorry. You just don't have to. So let's calm down a little bit. Let's let these games play out. Let's let Henry Davis and Jack Sawinski and – who else? Andrew McCutcheon and who else is not uh, really? It's uh, Davis. I mean, it's every, that's, that's it. Everybody else feels like they're doing really well right now. Um, even, you know, Joey Bart somehow in one game feels like he's doing well. Rowdy Telez has been the big surprise. This guy's been great. Uh, much better than what we thought. I mean, hitting the ball hard in every way. You could talk about Saturday night. Jake and I actually had a, a text conversation. Uh, and he said, you got to pinch hit for Rowdy Telez there. And I'm like, I'm, there's no way I'm pinch hitting for Rowdy Telez there. 
<coughs> excuse me. He his first at bat he hit one what 101, 100 and something. His second at bat was ninety five for a single. His next at bat after that was one hundred and six. Like the dude was seeing it. And I know that you have a lefty out there, but you've got bases loaded, nobody out. All he has to do is make contact uh, and not pop it out to the catcher, which is exactly what he did. But that's fine. I would have gone to that every time with a guy who was three for three and feeling it rather than pulling somebody off the bench ice cold in a big moment. Sometimes it works out. Other times it doesn't. I thought that you you ride the hot hand there with Rowdy Tellez. I 100% believe that. Jake does, you know, they end up winning and he said all's well that ends well, but... Um, but you know, Jake says he would have, he would have pinched it there. Here's the thing. And I've said this to a bunch of people. Rowdy Telez is not a platoon type player. And that's going to surprise a lot of people, but like he does his damage against righties without question, but his batting average and his on base percentage is better for his career against lefties. Not by a lot. It's like a 230 to 240 batting average, right? But he's but either way, that number is higher against lefties in batting average and on base percentage, which means that Rowdy Telez, when all you need is a flyout or a base hit or a walk, he actually is going to do, he has just as much of a chance to get that done against a lefty as he does against a righty. Just as much. Unless the lefty is like an electric shutdown note. Like if it's Josh Hader out there, well, of course, Josh Hader, righties don't even hit him. But if it's like a guy who just gets lefties out, I could understand you saying, let's go to a righty because of the pitcher, but not because of the hitter. Like Rowdy Telez is capable of coming through in that moment. So no, when he's three for three and he's hit each ball, he's one mile per hour off of three hard hit balls, Right. Two of them over a hundred. I'm leaving him in. I, I I believe that he's the guy that could have won that game right there. And it ended up being a different different play, but uh, you get the idea. Uh, that's I. We we have to stop with first off, like just saying a guy's left handed and he hits home runs, therefore he must not be able to hit against lefties. It's just not the case. Jack Swinski is a different guy. His splits show that he struggles versus lefties. However, he's also very young, and I think that he needs to see more at-bats. He's got one home run so far. It's off a lefty. If he can just continue to just hit home runs every once in a while and have a bad batting average, it still isn't a terrible thing to have him in the lineup over top of some other people if he's going to do damage. If it's a tough lefty, that's you give him a day off, 100%. But you just want a guy like that to play. We talked about Rowdy Telez last last week. We talked about him being 0 for 3 with three strikeouts and coming through in a big moment because of the fact that he had that game speed. You trust your guys. I don't know why when he's 3 for 3 with three with two hard hit balls and an almost hard hit ball uh, being 95 and, and harder considered a hard hit ball. I don't know why you would not go with him in that moment. So, you know, it's... For me, that's that's the way I would go every time. All right, let's wrap this thing up. We've got the Tigers coming to town, PNC Park. Tigers are six and three on the season. They started off five and one as well. They just lost two of three to the A's. Um, Monday, it's Reese Olson versus Keller. I, I got to admit, don't know anything about him. Tuesday, a uh, twelve thirty five game for those of you who can watch at work, like myself. Casey Mize versus Martin Perez. Casey Mize, big ERA, but like, like I said, these, these are early games. These are, what, two starts? That's fine. He's a good pitcher. So, tough matchup there. You'll um, The top of that lineup, Parker Meadows, Riley Green, Spencer Torkelson, all of them hitting under 200. Parker Meadows under 100 if he's still playing every day. And he was, he was, those are the top three hitters in today's lineup. Um, Riley Green did hit his third home run. On Sunday, but uh, all of them struggling as far as the batting average goes. 087, 188, and 184. Those guys are going to click soon. That's the young core that they have in Detroit. Uh, those guys will be probably, right? This is the way we do things. As Pirate fans, we know. We 
You talk about young talent, you expect them to be something. But uh, those guys will be all-stars at some point in their career. They're, they're good players. They're big prospect players type type thing. So they'll be good. Uh, should be should be interesting. It's a different Tigers team a little bit. Uh, they finished last season with the same record the Pirates did. They're kind of hoping for the same sort of thing to, to kind of get a little bit better. Um, like I said, they started off 5-0 and this year too. So just never know. Two of three to the A's, they probably – uh, probably leave him with a little – that's going to sting a little bit. Probably be a little bit mad coming out here. What do you want to do? I mean, so you want you want to sweep it. You want to split it. You can't get swept. Uh, other than that, you're, you're feeling pretty good. You got Wednesday off. You go into the weekend series against the Phillies Thursday through Sunday. It's four of them. So um, I'll see if I can get my friend who's a Phillies fan to get on here after that series and and talk a little bit about it. We'll see. Uh, other than that, I believe I will talk to you guys again on Friday morning. I will get something out there about the Tiger series and leading our way into the weekend. Thanks for sticking around with me uh, for this show. Had a lot to talk about, so I didn't have any problem getting through this one. But eight and two, guys. Let's go, Bucks. Thanks for listening to my dad and Uncle Jake on the Bridge to Bucktober podcast. Follow them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Bridge the Number Two Bucktober. Don't forget to subscribe so you know when new episodes are released. Clear the deck, cannonball coming, and let's go, Bucks!